Okay, so I'm going to attempt to narrate my process along with this video. Um, I've never done it this way before. I usually just try to talk while I'm painting. So you're going to hear dogs barking and maybe email coming in and my phone ringing and whatnot. But, and I'm going to try very hard not to say um very much, but I know I'm going to fail at that. So, to begin, my materials, I'm using a, an ampersand gesso board. It's a 5 by 7 and I have uh, the, the image drawn out on, that, on the panel with a charcoal pencil. And my goal for this block-in is just to cover the canvas, get rid of all the white. I don't usually tone my panels because I like to have pure color, um, which means that I, I will have to do this underpainting first in order to accurately judge all of my values. So this first block in, the background is transparent red oxide and ultramarine blue. I haven't thinned it with anything. It's, I'm just um, pushing the paint in, scrubbing it in so that it spreads it out thinly. And I'm using a bristle brush. I am just loosely blocking in and I apologize that I didn't zoom out enough and the top and bottom of the panel are kind of cut off so every now and then you'll see me painting out of the image frame um, so I've just about finished the background and I, I do like to work from back to front and so I'll do the background and then I move to the tabletop which is a um, marble surface um, so it's I've got light coming in from the left and from my north light window I have a still life stand set up right next to the window and then I block out some of the light so that I get a shadow you know in the background so the the back part this horizon line is very dark and then will be able to be very soft so that it kind of goes away I you know you can in the end finished painting you'll see that you can tell where the background stops and the table begins but the line will be very soft so it'll be very quiet and understated in the background um, I'm just mixing a gray with black ivory black um, uh, titanium white and a little bit of alizarin crimson and a touch of ultramarine blue. And then I went ahead and started blocking in the cast shadow. That's That and the background are gonna be the darkest things in the composition. Um, I like to get those in first because it really does serve to ground the objects onto the surface. Um, that was um, a little bit, it's the same mixture as the tabletop, but a lot more of it. So, alizarin crimson, ultramarine blue, and ivory black, and a little white. And then as I, as I lighten it, as it comes forward, I add a little bit more white, and um, maybe a touch of yellow ochre to warm it up a little bit. It's a it's a white marble, but it does all kinds of funny things in shadow and in the light too. 
gets goes warm and cool. It's fun to play with the surface of this marble. Um, so the neck, I'm mixing the next lightest shade or value of the surface, and I probably, uh, you can see, I'm, I'm taking bites out of that cast shadow. So I don't normally put that in first, but obviously since I'm filming myself, I do things all out of whack because it's stage fright or something. I don't know. Um, but anyway, I probably would not have put those cast shadows in in the beginning uh, until I had the whole surface placed in there because it, it, it is a little more difficult to put in the colors and values to paint those in without taking little bites out of the darker paint. Um, I'm using a bristle brush and a very big one. It's actually an angled brush. And what is it? It's actually not a bristle. It's a synthetic bristle by Princeton. It's a Dakota brush. Um, I kind of I really like these angled brush. It's my new favorite brush. Um, doing the leading edge, the front edge of that marble. Um, just blocking in a gradation from light to dark. Lighter towards the left where the light's coming from and darker towards the right. And I'm just freehanding that straight line I used a ruler to draw it in, but um, to paint it in, I'm just freehanding it. You can see what happens when you freehand. <laughs> I like to vary. Um, in, in, in this marble, you can see it starts out on the left with the lighter blue-gray and it gets a darker kind of blue-gray and then it gets a little warmer and goes more towards the purple and I'll blend that all in together but I like I like to have a variation in hue as well as value I think it adds a lot of visual interest to a painting to have you know instead of just having one gradation of light to dark in one hue having the variation gives it just a lot more visual interest. Paint mixing time. I don't even know, I don't remember what I'm mixing next. Oh, there we go the mass tone of the shadow side of the lemon. Um, that's that's going to be yellow ochre, transparent red oxide, and a, a skosh of my magic turquoise. <laughs> it's Holbein turquoise blue. And I use that quite a lot. It's a very weak Mixer. It's not. It's not a strong turquoise. Like some color, some turquoise paints are made with phthalos, and they're very strong. This one just barely affects the mixtures, but it does some really nice things. Takes down chroma really well. Um, so I mixed up this greenish reddish color, and just blocking the whole thing in for the shadow side of the lemon. <clears throat> I guess the next will be a slightly lighter... I'm, I'm, my goal is to kind of um, do a poster block in. So, you know, the, the 
the paint is going to be applied in some pretty broad sections. You know, going for like the local average. So this would be the uh, mid-tone in between the light and the dark. And it's got um, some cad yellow, some tur magic turquoise, <laughs> um, and I don't know what else. A little white, of course. No, actually, no white. Um, and I'm still kind of scrubbing everything in because my goal here is not to have a finished brush stroke or finished paint application or anything. It's just to get this canvas covered with an approximation of the colors and values that I need. So I'm going to wipe the brush and mix up the next one. I'm just going to be this one's the the one that I just put in is kind of more neutral in uh, hue. It's it's much less chromatic than what you're going to see next. And as you get towards the light, it gets much more chromatic and much lighter, of course. Um, I've got that part down there. interesting narrating this after I've already painted it because I'm just sitting here waiting for the paint mixing to go on. Okay, here we go. This is a much more chromatic light. Um, and, you know, I usually find that right before um, right before the uh, Half tone, you get the most chroma. So I would call this this mid tone, this middle green, green yellow, the half tone before the shadow shape, and then right before that, you get a lot of chroma. Chroma being the intensity of the color. So now I'm working in the light side of the lemon, using some lemon yellows, oddly. Uh, cad lemon, uh, cad yellow medium, and cad yellow light. But of course, none of these, are, these this is not straight cads out of, the, out of the tube. I've added a little white, I've added a little um, magic turquoise, to take down that chroma and maybe even a touch, just a tiny little take the corner of the brush and dip a few little bristles in some transparent red oxide in order to just get the tiniest little bit. <clears throat> but just slowly and methodically working my way across from dark to light and blocking it in. I'm leaving these shapes, you know, very geometric and blocky. Um, I wish I could actually leave them like that all the way through a painting, but I'm too wedded to reality, so I always wind up, um, you know, blending things and going for a more naturalistic look. I really admire people who can paint very broadly and um, paint the brush stroke and leave it. I'm not one of those painters. So this next one is going to be the lightest yellow that I have. 
on the first pass, I think, maybe. No, I guess I will have a little bit lighter. But it's gonna be um, cadmium lemon with a little with a little white in it and I don't remember whether I used anything to take down the chroma to like a complementary color to uh, reduce the chroma and he actually looks pretty chromatic so it's probably just cad lemon and white and I like this bigger brush because it it forces me to stay broad and stay you know thinking in huge shapes of color and value rather than getting a little brush out even though a little brush would be a lot more user friendly in these smaller spaces but I know I know for myself that if I get a smaller brush I will immediately start doing details and you know not focusing on the big picture so I use a big brush for as long as I can and I'm also using the same brush for everything um, I, I tend to do that a lot even though I have hundreds of brushes and I buy brushes every time I go to the art supply store um, when I'm painting when I'm in the zone I just keep wiping the same brush and using it over and over again unless I need a you know like the pure color on the Le on the left there I I would well actually I didn't I use the same brush so yeah on the second layer I'll probably use more brushes um, anyway I'm almost done blocking it in I have to get in the reflection which the first layer of that will be much more chromatic and then my second pass I'll wind up dragging some of the um, table color over that to kind of push it back so that it's not so in your face. So first layer blocked in, now I'm taking a giant um, mongoose brush, oh, you can see I dropped a hair right there, I'm going to pull that out. Um, it's a Langnickel Royal Sable, so it's not a mongoose, um, and I'm just kind of fusing everything together. I want soft edges everywhere. Because I'm, and well, number one, my first paint layer was very thin. No, you know, no big piles of paint on the brush. And I pretty much scrubbed everything in. But now I'm just taking the brush and wholesale softening over everything just to knock down any ridges and make sure that all the edges are nice and nice and soft. I forgot to soften out the, or blend in those those gradations so I'm doing that really quickly and that's about it for the first layer of the block in
And now begins the second pass. So this is a mixture of Viridian and Alizarin Crimson. It makes a nice neutral dark that I can lightly paint over the initial scrub in that I did. Um, and I'm using this time a very soft synthetic brush. It's a synthetic sable from Princeton. Um, it's a bright, it's pretty big, so I can do this broadly too. Um, once, once you go in for a second layer, you really have to use, if you're doing Alla Prima, you have to use very soft brushes. Otherwise, you'll just kind of gouge out the paint that you already put on. So um, I think you'll notice that sometimes um, the approach of the brush is is very flat. Like you don't go at a you don't do a brush stroke at a per perpendicular approach. It's you you lay the brush almost parallel to the panel, so that when you're laying the paint on, it doesn't do any gouging. Um, and I'm trying. I'm also trying to prevent glare so that you can see what's going on. So I'm doing a lot of kind of massaging the paint stroke, put it down and then soften it out. Um, on this layer, I'm much more concerned with paint application and accuracy. So I'll, you'll notice that I'll be much more careful in my drawing and try, I'm trying not to, you know, overshoot edges unless I intend to. But also using this big brush still enables me to, to block it in very broadly and not get too precious with the strokes. So it's just work your way across, cover the whole thing. And I'm really just barely, barely touching the canvas panel. Um, it does, it really does require a light touch. And you'll see later on in this painting when I start working on the actual on the lemons, I wind up getting so much paint on there that at times it does become a little difficult because paint wants to it everything's so wet that it's kind of sliding around and I'm instead of instead of doing a paint stroke, I'm kind of removing paint and it's it can get a little difficult. It's one of the benefits of doing um, layered paintings is that each layer underneath is dry so you don't have that problem but with Alla Prima, well at least my method of Alla Prima where I do an underpainting first, um, you, do, you do have to be much more careful in your, on your second layer. I'm not using any medium. It's all straight paint. Um, I use medium in indirect painting when I am, you know, glazing something. I'll use medium. I'll do a couch of medium over the over the area that I'm going to glaze and then put the paint on and then kind of wipe it off, wipe the paint and the glaze off. Um, but I do try to keep it as simple as possible because the less adulterations you do to your paint, the better off you are. Um, you know, keep it simple, stupid. Kiss. Oh, didn't mean to call you stupid. Please forgive me. So I'm basically going to be doing the same thing over again, you know, uh, from 
back to front, dark to light. So the next thing will be the uh, tabletop and the back edge. And of course you can see that, you know, the value that I can achieve on the second pass is much darker. Um, and I'll, I'll be uh, darkening the tabletop as well because I want that back edge to be really quiet and soft. So the closer those values are together, the less your eye will be drawn to it. Your eye goes to the highest contrast. Like on the left side of this lemon, you can, you know, against the dark background, your eye just automatically goes there first. And I'm using, still using that soft synthetic sable brush and it's a flat, which I, I really like crisp flats for just this reason that you see here, you can use it to paint a very straight line, not by, not by scribing the line across, but by carving it out one stroke at a time vertically, but using the flat of the brush to actually, you know, um, make that straight line. Now I'm getting a soft brush and just kind of stitching the two together, the background and the tabletop. And then after stitching it together, I go across it again and you can see it makes a really nice soft edge. And the goal with that being that a soft edge, your eye is not drawn to it, just like it's not, your eye is not, or your, let's see, your eye is drawn to high contrast. It's also drawn to sharp edges. Um, so if I want that background to be nice and quiet, I keep the value relationships very close and I keep the edges very soft. So then look, I brought out a smaller brush because <laughs> the other one is kind of like a bull in the china shop. Um, it would be really hard to cleanly paint these areas with that big brush. So I pull out a smaller brush when I need it. I'm basically a self-taught painter. I joined a painting forum way back when the internet forums were a thing before Facebook killed those and um, read exhaustively, posted my work for critique, got critiqued so viciously <laughs> that I'd cry myself to sleep. And then um, I kept and embraced the things that I thought made sense and discarded what didn't and taught myself to paint. And I think that anybody can learn to paint. You pretty much just have to have a burning desire to do so. <laughs> Um, so the, that lighter gray, blue gray that I put in, I think you'll see that I wind up coming back and darkening that it was way too light. It's kind of hard to judge until you have everything in, whether your values are accurate. So you just have to get it in there and reassess. But it's not possible for that on that lemon on the right the cast shadow it's not possible for the surface to be that bright given the values of the surface in the lemon in the space between the lemons and to the left of the lemons so i will be going back and darkening that down all in good time
have the camera in between me and the easel. I mean, sorry, in between myself and my painting. So <laughs> you can kind of hear me breathing into the microphone. And I kind of have to reach around the the monopod, the, my phone, I'm videoing this with my phone. I have to reach around that to paint, but it works nicely. You can get, you can see the same thing I'm seeing, which is kind of neat, instead of having it at an angle. I'm stitching the values together so that those the gradation is a nice soft gradation. There's a little more paint on it this time than the first, but still not I'm not piling the paint on by any means. for the um, mass tone of the shadow shape and it is darker than my initial block in it's a greenish yellow um, made with some yellow ochre transparent red oxide some Holbein turquoise and I don't know what else <laughs> but I'm using this very soft sable flat for this one and the paint's going on a little thicker which is going to wind up giving me problems later. <laughs> I'm continually wiping the brush and reloading. You can see how it's kind of picking up a little bit of the underpainting, which is fine. But I'm basically it's just a repeat of the process I did in the beginning. It's blocking in major shapes. And then once I get it all blocked in, I'll go back in and add nuances little bits of accent darks, reflected lights, um, hue changes. Some of these strokes are you know, testing strokes to see if it's the right color. You know, you mix, I'm mixing on the fly here, so I mix up a color and I don't know it's right till I put it on there. So I'm constantly assessing, looking at the setup, 
looking at the painting, comparing. One of the difficulties of it is that the, the more you look at your subject, the more information your eyes are going to take in, or your brain is going to take in. Your eyes, you know, I guess as you look into, like, especially the shadow sides of things, your eye, the more you look at it, the more your eye takes in, the more information. So your task as a painter is to simplify that. And at least in the beginning, you know, get your difference between your light shape and your shadow shape. And then never the twain shall meet. You got to keep all your darks in the dark side, in the shadow side, and your lights in the light side. If you start putting, like, your reflected light, if you make that too light, all of a sudden it's no longer in the shadow. You've destroyed the illusion that you're creating. So you have to be really careful and conscious about keeping the shadow side and the light side separate. So this is the mid-tone, slightly greenish, um, yellow ochre, and the Holbein turquoise blue, maybe a touch of transparent red oxide again. Did I say mid-tone? I mean half-tone. It's the area between the shadow shape and the lights. <laughs> I'm not going to go back and edit that if I said mid-tone. Actually, it's the same thing, but I'm going to get the terms right. Now I put that in and then I said to myself, that's way too chromatic and it's orange. I'm painting lemons, not oranges. So I took it down a little bit. I eventually reach a point in this painting where I kind of flounder around. I wonder if I should fast forward past all that. <laughs> or do you want to see the good, bad, and the ugly? I'm doing a lot of squinting at the subject not at my painting. It does you no good to squint at your painting. Squinting is great for your painting, but not so great for the wrinkles around your eyes. <laughs> oh well, your smile lines. So see, I just put in a color there that was not the right color, so I 
changed it, or painted over it. This is where I'm winding up getting a lot of paint on here. So when I want to make little adjustments, I wind up running the risk of gouging into the paint because it's getting really thick. But the fun part for me is uh, coming up with these beautiful little moments where you have something really bright and then something, you know, in shadow. So it's, you know, very dramatic and, you know, because painting is all about the light, right? Without, without the light, you don't really have a painting. I mean, you don't have a naturalistic painting. So, painting in that light is really gratifying. So trying to stay broad in this stage where I'm blocking in the second layer and once I get that all blocked in I'm gonna go in and soften it out again but not not like I did before um, it'll be much more selective and careful but I do want to you know blend my layers together or I'm sorry blend the gradients together I'm putting in an intermediary color between the mid-tone or the half-tone and the shadow. And see, it's already picking up as I do the paint strokes. It's picking up the color and depositing it back in unpleasant ways. <laughs> Definitely having soft brushes is essential for this type of painting. This is a rosemary um, Long Flat Series 279. It's a mongoose and it's very soft and it does a really good job of softening things without disturbing the actual underlying paint. And it's much smaller than that Lang nickel, so it's not going to, you know, it's not going to go outside the lines. I've created. So that's the basic block in for the lemons. I still haven't finished the tabletop and the front edge of the table. 
but wanted to get to the to the fun part main subject so now it's a matter of coming back and adding the nuances wherever there's accent darks addressing edges, outside edges, edges of the object itself, not the interior edges. <clears throat> Sometimes I, I modify edge, outside edges by actually doing the same sort of stitching like I did between the background and the surface where I zigzag across it. And then sometimes it's just how you apply the paint with the brush stroke where you're maybe pushing a little bit harder so you're allowing the brush to kind of splay outward into the background and it will, you know, simultaneously soften the edge of the lemon and, and the, the background or table that you're painting against. Um, it depends on how much softer you need an edge. This is also a Rosemary Mongoose Brush series. Um, it's a long, long flat series. Oh no, that's a Filbert. Long Filbert series 278. There's some edge addressing. Um, I think I wanted that edge to be a little harder. Um, you know, the edges in the shadow side will be softer. And the one on the light side will be harder. I'm kind of dabbing the brush and that allows it to deposit a little bit of paint, pick it up, deposit it, pick it up, deposit it. So it's giving a little bit of that skin texture of the lemon. And I don't know if you can tell just how light of a touch I'm using, but it's like a whisper across the panel. Um, and then you, you can see areas where I am not pressing so lightly and if I want to deposit more paint, but in these areas where I'm just doing tiny little modifications, it's just a whisper. And then that was a harder a harder push because it was right along the edge. <laughs> that was Pete, my parakeet. He would, he belonged to my dad. When my dad died, I inherited him. That was in 2016. Um, he's, he was born in 2008, I believe, so he's kind of an old, old little guy. Right there, I popped in a much lighter light, so you can see, you can see actually how, how 
much I'm working in the midtones, really. Once you once you actually get a light in there, you can, it shows you how much <laughs> how much of a midtone you're working in. And because that area is high contrast, I want that edge to be a little harder. So I went back in, um, you know, without blending, made that edge harder. Trying to keep the detail only in the light. That also helps with the illusion of light and shadow and 3D form. You know, we don't see as much detail in the shadow as we do in the light, so if you put details in your shadows, then you're kind of belying that illusion that you're trying to create. So if you're painting a portrait of somebody and they have freckles, you only put the freckles in the light. Pete's flying around the studio. Now for little details, you actually do get it. You get to use a tiny brush. Those are um, Princeton Velvet Touch rounds. See a little gouge that took out of that. I begin to do a lot of little futzing around here. Um, and I have to go back and speed through all of this because I feel like it can get really tedious watching this part.
Here's a small round and then placing, uh, cleaning up the bottom edge of the lemon and doing the very, the, the occlusion shadow where the object is, where the beginning of the cast shadow comes from. It's always the darkest. Um, And then I'll have to address that bottom edge of the lemon as it rolls into that occlusion shadow. And of course I went from back to front, so now it's time to address the details on the front lemon. Hopefully it won't be as tedious as the back lemon was. <laughs> I'm just letting, again, letting paint pick up and deposit back and forth a little bit darker into the little bit lighter areas so that I can get texture. <clears throat> it's tricky to do when there's so much paint on the canvas and it's all wet, but Can be a really effective way to show texture like on the citrus skin <laughs> or you can just make a mess this front lemon has a reflected light from the tabletop bouncing up into it so right by the bottom of it where I'm painting now where the inclusion shadow is um, then you have the, the shadow side of the lemon and then the reflected light from the table and then shadow side again so the uh, reflected light has to be darker than you think it is and it's also generally much less chromatic than what you're painting that into. Also, I should mention that the phone is kind of um, increasing the chroma from what it actually is. So the, the painting isn't quite this chromatic, especially the yellow.
Oh, I must have noticed something over there I didn't <laughs> I needed to address. <clears throat> Probably had too much detail in there. There's a bit of that reflected light. It's a little greener, a little less chromatic. I've really come to love painting these little five by seven little vignettes of food, little slices of life. Um, I do them quite often and I auction, offer them for sale on my website at auction. Um, so if you're interested in finding out more about the auction paintings and how you can buy one of these or bid on one um, you can go to my website my link is in my description and uh, sign up to receive notifications of upcoming auctions and um, this one this painting I completed uh, the day before yesterday or the day before the day before yesterday <laughs> and auctioned it off over a two-day period. Um, but anyway, uh, I, started, I started painting food. Actually, when I first started painting, I started with food. Um, my first painting that I sold in a gallery was a couple of tomatoes and a colander and uh, a cutting board. And I like creating these little vignettes that are, you know, kind of like a moment interrupted um, in someone's life. And, you know, everybody has to eat so everybody can relate to food. Um, and you can create some really lovely little dramatic tiny paintings of food. Um, so I've started putting in highlights here and uh, I'm probably going to go back in and take some of them out put them back in again. This is one of my favorite painters. Someone who actually introduced me to painting was Helen Van Wyck on PBS. I used to love to watch her paint. That woman could flat out paint a still life in an hour and it was gorgeous every time um, but she always talked about putting in a, a highlight you put it in then you break it down then you put it back in so I try to do that again trying to pick up and put down paint back and forth a little bit lighter in a darker area and vice versa to get that texture of the skin without going too crazy with detail. And this painting took me um, about an hour and a half. I videoed an hour and 23 minutes of it 
an hour and 24 minutes of it. Um, and then I did about five minutes worth of detail work that I did once I moved the camera so I could get in there a little closer. Um, which I'll show you the, the final image at the end. Didn't mean to drag that yellow out into the surface there. Mm -hmm. so have to go back in, clean that up. I'm honing in on the ending here. There are a lot of artists that I watch videos of their work and I really do admire how how they can discuss painting, you know, why they do it and philosophy of art and all of that. I've just never been really good at that. <laughs> um, I just let my art speak for itself you know they have that that adage that says it's better to be silent and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt <laughs> so this is very difficult for me to speak non-stop for an hour and a half um, especially about my own work but I'm doing it for entertainment purposes education purposes whatever um, here's that big brush again big synthetic flat and I'm trying to get a darker front edge of that marble. I'm kind of dragging it over the surface so that it picks up a little bit of what was below, but also leaves a texture. It's kind of like a dry brush technique. Even though it's not dry brush because everything on the canvas is wet. Still being mindful of that gradient and changing hue as well as value.
I still have to address those cast shadows. They're pretty garish right now. I'm dragging some of the background or the surface color over those reflection colors. That's a that's a blue gray on the outside edge of that cast shadow. Cleaning up that bottom edge. It needs a much darker occlusion shadow. There go the dogs. So people call the occlusion shadow the crevice shadow. It's just the blocking of all the light. I'm making a mess.
reach a point in your painting where what you start doing to it is not improving it, but rather making it worse, it's time to stop. <laughs> it's so easy to just keep futzing with it and you end up it's taking steps backward instead of forward. And I'm almost to that point. I do I still have to address the cast shadows. And it is closing in on the finish. Um, and as I said, I'll show you the final after I did a few more minutes of detail work. Um, but if you like what you see, subscribe. Leave me a comment down below. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to watch. So until next time. <laughs>